Listener, and welcome to Failure to Launch, the space history podcast where we take you through every mistake, failure, and explosion that made modern space exploration possible. We are, as always, your hosts, Quinn, Chris, and Chris. Yeah, back for a big triumphal uh, return for any of our listeners who are still hanging around, um, any of the fives or sixes of them. Uh, a few months ago, we put out some uh, some fun episodes, and then this whole project kind of fell into a hiatus. So for anyone new to the show, the idea is that we research failures in space history that aren't well known and report them to you uh, for educational and comedic purposes. Because, you know, with all of the really cool space stories out there, we think it's pretty easy to forget that the whole field is only about 60 years old, and most of the lessons learned in space had to be learned the hard way. Like, some people believe pencil and rockets were a good thing. My God. <laughs> um, to start things off with this one, it's going to be a bit of a weird one. Um, today, we're going to be doing an episode about Yuri Gagarin, the first man in space, and specifically how his legacy and the cult around him um, has changed and been used by those in power over the years. I'd been planning on covering all of this later in some episodes about Gagarin's life and his impact on space exploration, and all of that is still coming, but due to some recent events, I feel that this is an important uh, topic to cover now. Specifically, the propaganda around Gagarin and around space exploration as a whole is a very interesting, very messed up topic. Um, as, we, as we all know, the Cold War uh, was a heavily political conflict. Space exploration was just the means by which the two superpowers and later a bunch of other countries tried to show each other up. It was never actually the main focus. Also, when dealing with space propaganda, you've got the fact that there was not a lot of cooperation early on. So every country kind of had to go it for themselves. Because of that, a lot of those countries have their you know one or two big achievements that they are stupid proud of. America and the USSR and Russia – uh, of course, have a lot more of them. But, you know, for example, I'm Canadian. We care a lot about the Canada arm. I don't know why. It's on the $5 bill. Again, I, I don't know why. It's just the thing we did in space that we're stupid proud of. And then you've got, you've got the moon landing. You've got, um, you've got Sputnik, Gagarin. The British launched the Black Arrow. All kinds of things like that. I guess, I guess for you guys, like what are, whenever it comes to like, Thinking about space exploration, like what's the first thing that just like pops into your head? I know both of you guys are American, so I want to get that uh, that sample size. Oh, I immediately think of the and, slow motion footage of the Saturn V taking off. Oh yeah, me too. It is, is actually me up a, on too it's many a good one. Occasions. You know, I was actually so, talking. I was actually talking to my supervisor about this earlier. Is the fact that like we we literally cannot build the Saturn V. Oh, well, the amount of bespoke components and the, how yeah, much the amount of bespoke components <laughs> and like the fact that board. probably <laughs> most of the guys that had any hand in engineering that thing have like passed away by now, assuredly. Okay, but like you can't. I I, I, I get that, and I have there. There is a lot of discussion around that kind of stuff. My personal take on it is not to invalidate what you're saying. Um, we can't build the right airplane either. We don't have assembly lines that can churn out Shermans or T-34s or Spitfires or anything like that. It's simply maybe, gone in maybe a different the Saturn direction. Five, then maybe the Saturn V should have been kept around. Maybe we should have kept those plans handy. But you Well, know. I mean, I, the unfortunate reality of the situation is that, you know, 
the government isn't very good with money, right? So absolutely not. It's a uh, more cost effective to have corporations do it, whose no. primary interest is the bottom line. Um. No, just no. no. What do you mean? No, it's it's reducing their costs as much as possible while offering a service to people for as much as they can get. While getting it's... colossal tax kickbacks. Yeah, there you go, man. Yeah. That's, that's it. That's it. I mean, we're not going to have a Saturn V again because we don't need a rocket that big. You know. Well, I mean, that's, there's that's... De- there's definitely markets for it, and also I, enough I, I... heavy launch systems do exist to get around that problem. Circling back to Gagarin, so. 61 years ago, on April 12th, 1961, Senior Lieutenant Yuri Alexeyevich Gagarin became the first man in space. His spacecraft, Vostok 1, was launched into orbit atop a modified R-7 ICBM, the same rocket that carried the earlier Sputnik satellites. He spent almost two hours in space and passed the time observing the Earth, writing notes in his journal, and getting promoted twice. His flight was a major breakthrough in space exploration, probably greater than that of Sputnik four years earlier, and Major Gagarin returned to Earth as a legendary hero of the Soviet Union who would help shape the culture for decades to come. And that is what I want to talk about. We'll leave the biography to another time and focus here on the cult of cosmonaut number one. Origins of the Cult of Yuri Gagarin The cult of Yuri Gagarin was born within hours of his landing, not as successful propaganda, but actually as a cover-up. See, contrary to the official reports, Gagarin's landing did not go smoothly. His capsule failed to separate from the rest of his spacecraft and spun wildly out of control through most of the re-entry. He landed over 500 kilometers off target near the city of Saratov, which is coincidentally where he had gone to technical school earlier. Because rescue teams were nowhere nearby, cosmonaut number one landed in public. He had to approach a group of farmers to get a horse to get to a group of soldiers who could contact the Kremlin, all while being followed around by crowds of curious locals. While this might sound like the stuff of folk legend in the making, Gagarin's KGB handlers were horrified to find that he'd been talking to locals about his flight. Even worse, a crowd had gathered around his abandoned capsule. People were climbing on it, taking pictures, and even stealing small pieces of equipment for souvenirs. One farmer managed to make off with the spacecraft's entire stock of space food tubes. Now, the reason all of this was bad for the Kremlin was that the Vostok spacecraft and the entire launch, not to mention Gagarin's own identity, were all still close-guarded state secrets. The original plan was to control the information and brag about the accomplishment while remaining vague about the actual details, all of which is impossible when farmers strip your space capsule for parts and your cosmonaut rolls into town on a horse at the head of a cheering crowd. This rules. Yeah. No, it, it's it's great. Like, he just... It's... It, like, it really is, like, folk legend stuff, and it's exactly what, like, the official propagandists in the KGB and at the Kremlin don't want. Like, they have his story written out, and he is writing... He, like, reality is writing it against them. He has taken the narrative. Yeah, and <laughs> it's like, I like, there's a joke in there about landing your spacecraft in a bad neighborhood and it winding up on blocks. Um, I don't know how to make it. I will leave that to the imagination of the listener. Um, that's your homework, listener. Have fun. Now, obviously, obviously this situation didn't last. If there's one thing the Kremlin's good at, it's suppressing information. When Gagarin made contact with his handlers, he was quickly spirited away to Moscow. His capsule was put under guard and covered with a black tarp, and the Soviet government started a cover-up to prevent anyone from learning the true details of his flight. Now, a bit of an aside here, the cover-up actually took a bit of effort because, especially around his spacecraft, these engineers show up, they cover it in a tarp, but all of the farmers don't leave. Like, they keep hanging around, they keep asking questions and the only way that the engineers can convince them to leave is they have to like take the tarp off and do like a very quick rundown and a lecture on the spacecraft. They have to point stuff out and go like, all right, that's the altimeter. That's that. They they let the farmer keep they took all of the space food tubes back except for one, which the farmer had already eaten. So they let him keep it as a souvenir. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's just do, a, it's do, a fun it's do you a fun think he story. enjoyed it though is the question i okay nobody can brag about it i don't have the quote um <laughs> but 
the book did list him as being toothless. So pureed meat maybe was pretty good to him. Shit, that's living the life right there. Yeah. So like one of the reasons they were able to talk to these farmers safely about this, you know, incredibly advanced spacecraft is that the city of Saratov was what is known as a closed city. Um, and still is to this day. These are cities where normally because they have, you know, military bases, research institutes, um, or defense industries, all entry and exit is tightly controlled and the media is incredibly regulated. So, and these cities, you know, they still exist all over the world, but you can find them a lot in Russia and other post-Soviet countries. Because Saratov was already under a permanent information lockdown, there was no way for any unauthorized news to escape. And so the official story was the only one that could be spread. Since no actual details about the launch could be published, the Soviets instead opted to lie. So they chose to twist the truth. Yeah, yeah. Like, well, a truth masseuse, if you will. It's, it was more of the fact that because they couldn't tell like, any actual details about the launch, they, they opted to lie instead. And where, where a specific detail was redacted from the record, they didn't just leave the space blank. They didn't just put you know, a black highlighter through it. Um, they just made up new specifics. Uh, as we'll see later, like with, with Soviet propaganda, one of the things you notice a lot is that all of their rockets look like the stereotypical V2 Tintin rocket. And that's because it was banned by law for Soviet uh, propagandists to draw accurate rockets because they wanted it to be that secret. And, you know, like, oh, generico oh, rocket number two. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and, and we'll see some examples of that later. But um, for now, huh. yeah, the, the, the idea was to allow Khrushchev to brag about his achievement without giving away any you know, secrets to Western uh, intelligence agencies. But, but that still left hundreds of millions of Soviet citizens waiting to hear about their newest space breakthrough. Uh, to give you a bit of an idea, I'm going to quote from the very good book, The Cosmonaut Who Couldn't Stop Smiling by Andrew Jenks. Quote, Due to the strict regime of secrecy and national security, the Soviet space program, unlike NASA, was managed by the political leadership and by the military industry. Journalists were allowed to publish virtually nothing about the engineers whose technology had launched Gagarin into space. Sergei Korolev, the father of Soviet rocketry, was publicly known as the chief designer. Unable to discuss much else, Soviet journalists focused on the biographies of the cosmonauts, a convenient diversion, it should be noted, from the technological details of the flight, a kind of curtain that disguised the working side of the cosmonautics experiment. The upshot of all this was an intense personality cult focused on Yuri Gagarin. For the sake of brevity, I'm going to leave a lot of details about Gagarin and his actual life for later episodes. We will talk about that, just not now. Here we're going to focus on his legacy and how the propaganda narrative around him changed with time. Um, and it's important to note that the Gagarin cult actually started off pretty slow. While the celebrations were immediate and he became a, you know, a great hero of the land, at first the Kremlin was content to let his life you know, speak for itself. He, his life was a very good story. It was part of why they had picked him to fly first. Gagarin had grown up a peasant, survived Nazi occupation, and worked his way up to being a pilot. He had both the proletarian credentials of a peasant and the relatability of a normal Russian dude from the country. He was a down-home farm kid. All of this made it very easy for people to relate to him and for his achievements to make regular Soviets feel good about themselves. Gagarin wasn't impossibly above them, and he was living proof of what any Russian kid could accomplish. The propagandist didn't need to write much of a story because it wrote itself. Combine this with a major push to spread televisions and radios to every farm in the country, and you had millions of Soviet citizens hanging on his every word. My favorite thing so far about Gagarin is that his story ruled and then they went and they had to make it so that every time there was a new premier, right? The leader of the Soviet Union is the premier. Am I getting that right? Yeah. Yeah. When there is a new premier of the Soviet Union, they have to redesign him so that he's like them. Well, yeah. And or what closer to their approximation of the ideal Soviet, which would be themselves. <laughs> uh, it's actually it's actually kind of funny because 
there's a lot of there's a lot of statues of Gagarin around, and there's you know the classic thing is oh here's a statue of him by himself, here's a statue of him um, with Sergei Korolev showing that they basically had like a father son relationship. There's also a bunch of him just yeah hanging out with different um, Soviet premiers. Including ones who became premier after he died. So <laughs> it, 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 no, it, it, it does rule. It does rule. It's just like, man, you know what? So what, time travel? Yeah. Or I, I don't know. Maybe if I want to give them the benefit of the doubt, maybe it's like, you know, before they died. I much prefer, on the other hand, it, it'd be like if a US president was just like, hey, paint me with Lincoln, paint, paint me hanging, <laughs> paint me hanging out with Neil Armstrong on the moon. <laughs> Just slapping hands. Creating new Gagarin. So, yes. previously we talked about how the propagandist did not need to change his uh, Yuri Gagarin's story because it, you know, it was already the perfect proletarian story. But this was the Soviet Union. And no good story can't be edited into a great story. When the changes did come, the first thing to actually happen was, a uh, surprisingly enough, it was a reshuffle of his family. Gagarin's mother was an eager adopter of the cult and reveled in her newfound fame, even becoming the, di- the de facto director of the Gagarin Museum in their hometown. Um, she was also propped up as the perfect mother, whose superior mentoring had shaped the perfect Soviet child. Yuri's brother and father were different stories. His brother had a drinking problem and mental health issues both heavily stigmatized by Soviet culture. Furthermore, he was living proof that maybe Anna Gagarina wasn't the perfect mother. Uh, it was thus convenient to write him out of the narrative. Yuri's father, Alexei, meanwhile, was very public about his hatred of the cult developing around their family. He was a communist hardliner and a strong believer in Khrushchev's de-Stalinization policies. He was personally offended that his son would gain a cult of personality like Stalin had. When he found out that their hometown had decided to change their name from Gazachsk, I'm, I'm, I butchered that uh, pronunciation, um, we will put it on the video for the viewers. To Gagarin, he shouted, Why is it always Gagarin this and Gagarin that? He didn't found the city. He didn't build it. For 250 years, people have lived and worked in the city. You have to respect history. Yeah, like, I want to take a second to just talk about the irony of this man living in the Soviet Union and demanding that they respect history. Like He had to have known. What, you mean the, the, the whole... the? Ukrainian autonomous region thing? No, 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 no. I'm, no. Just, I'm like, just talking about this, like, like. Ugh. How many times have people been edited out of pictures? How exactly. Many times this is, this is not. This is not new. Renamed? Oh, that one's my favorite. The one with Stalin and and the guy who doesn't matter because he got erased from the picture. I can't even remember <laughs> what his name is because the the propaganda was so effective. You know, Gagarin's dad. Wasn't cool with Brezhnev, wasn't cool with the cult of personality developing around his son, and made it very clear that he didn't like that. Uh, so they wrote him out of history. But just the, the fun thing is that they didn't entirely write him out. Um, see, he doesn't show up often in Gagarin's official histories, but when he does, he's often actually depicted as Yuri's uncle, which I love. I love that the Kremlin can just go, can just point at someone and go, oh, you have some complaints? Fuck You're demoted. You. You're demoted to uncle. They demoted a man to uncle because they didn't agree with him. They didn't disappear him. They just made I his demoted. son. They made his son not his son anymore. I've demoted you to uncle. Pray I don't demote you further. <laughs> I'm gonna make you a second cousin if you don't I've, shut up. I've altered the family lineage. <laughs> Pray I don't alter it further. <laughs> further. <laughs> Perfect. Oh. Uh. Anyway, once they start reshuffling his family uh, and the cult was going in full swing, a sort of dam broke with the propagandists. If you can turn a father into an uncle and delete an inconvenient brother, what's to stop you from editing everything else about the great hero? The censor started off by editing his childhood, streamlining it to better fit the idea of a hardworking Soviet lad from the country. People who knew Gagarin or had grown up with him were flown to Moscow for meetings with the KGB, where they were given the scripts that they would tell journalists asking about Gagarin. Uh, Everything was tuned to present Gagarin as the paragon of Soviet manhood, from his altered childhood to his new family. This is who we are today. I, I I love hearing the description of this and then just thinking that 
they're just making a reality TV show. They are. They're they're giving his friends like it, the friends who grew up with him. The journalists want to go talk to them to ask like, oh, what what was Yuri like as a kid? And all of them have been given scripts literally by the KGB. It's just like um, he was very hardworking. He was always rippling. Um, he had amazing abs. Um, I knew him when he was six. He was positively virile. <laughs> Yeah, like they they've they've been given the talking points and they yeah they they went so far and those journalists were also propagandists so they were propagandizing to their they were lying to the liars who would oh, then that's beautiful. who would then take those lies and then lie about them so the the soviet citizens were getting like multiple layers of like refried lies being sold to them that slowly uh went from this is a cool Soviet dude, and like this guy shows that any Soviet kid who works hard can be a spaceman. And uh, they start like turning him into a superhero. Uh, and, and later we're going to see this actually becomes a problem. Oh, no. I just had a thought of the, the conspiracy theory iceberg meme. And then I'm like still somewhere up towards the top where I'm like reality TV. But there's nothing real about reality TV because it's all part of the script. There's nothing real about it, you know? Like, and, then, and then somewhere far, far, far below the surface is your dad is your uncle. <laughs> yes. Gagarin was giving speeches about his family and his experience growing up. At some point, they had to tell him, uh, hey, by the way, uh, we, we rewrote a little bit. You might see that footnote there. Your dad – um, had to cut him. Your brother doesn't exist. Uh, don't don't talk about him. Cool. We'll wipe him from your memory. Yeah, and <laughs> but yeah, like Garen Garen went along with it. He was a he was a willing participant. Oh god. So yeah, like like the propaganda. For most Soviets, it worked. Uh, the, the Kremlin was able to spin Gagarin from this famously tipsy, womanizing pilot into the template of Soviet masculinity, and they actually recruited him to help spread their new morality codes. According to these rules, every Soviet citizen should be like Gagarin, honest, sober, truthful, simple, and humble in private and public life. As with his speeches, Gagarin's public conduct was in direct contradiction to these codes. Uh, leading to multiple versions of the Soviet space hero, where a person could effectively pick the Gagarin they liked best. From Andrew Jenks, quote, Gagarin's curious hybrid of the official Soviet hero and the modern celebrity made him potentially attractive to a variety of constituencies, from testosterone-driven males and swooning teenage girls to Russian nationalists and party moralists. It also reflected a fundamental change in Soviet society since Stalin's death. More than just aspects of his personal biography, the many strands of Gagarin's post-flight life convey the paradoxical essence of the male homo sovieticus in the 1960s, someone who combined selfless service to the state with the tireless pursuit of pleasure and leisure. Now, now this is where our story actually splits. Um, in order to understand the role that Gagarin played and continues to play in Russian culture, it's important to know that propaganda and rumor created multiple versions of the same man to appeal to different demographics. Uh, it's 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 like a super. It's like he stepped into a reactor or something, and like five different Gagarins Gagarin popped came out. out. Exactly. Um, there were plenty of different aspects of Gagarin to so for Soviets to pick from, but for the sake of this episode and brevity, I'll boil it down to the main three versions. Gagarin as a Soviet cosmic star citizen pushing the boundaries of science for all mankind, Gagarin as a paragon of Russian patriotism and youth, and Gagarin as the first Soviet sex symbol. I hate that sentence. Gagarin, the Soviet star citizen. Okay, so this first Gagarin is the one that most of our listeners are probably familiar with. This is the man in the orange jumpsuit astride the earth holding a hammer and sickle above his head. What we're going to do is I'm going to give you guys a couple of uh, old Soviet propaganda posters to describe, and I'm going to give you the title. So we're going to start off with this one, and the tagline is, The Fairy Tale Became Truth. Let's see, we have El Generico Rocket in the background. Well, we've learned so far. Par for the course. And we have... I can only assume this is Yuri in a spacesuit. Oh yeah, that's Yuri. <laughs> just just gently cupping a star? 
Yeah. And it's, just it's a that it, it, this is a weird look on his face. Yeah, you you got a you got a smiling he's just gently just gently coughing. You just oh look at he's, that. He's, hold, he's holding the power in his hands. It's a it's a smiling Gagarin holding a star in the palm of his hands. That's not um, a normal smile though. That is a no. They they didn't really capture they didn't capture his trademark grin very well. The artist did not do that. All right, this one is called. Glory to the space heroes, glory of the Soviet people. Uh, so the Earth is radiant like a star. There are no countries on the Earth other than the USSR. There are, like, <laughs> orbital lines around it, like we've launched many, many more Yuri Gagarins and Sputniks. And Yuri Gagarin is leading a procession of the proletarians who are slowly turning into cosmonauts from peasant farmers. We got the shepherd's hook. The space is background. The, the background, like the backdrop of space is no longer black, a black void. It is filled red. with the red blood of the workers. <laughs> Stars twinkle in the background. You've got like, um, you've got the, the welder on the left there. You've got the farmers in the middle. And then it's right into cosmonaut scientists and leading them all is Yuri Gagarin. Who, who, who's holding, <laughs> who's holding like a notepad and he's gesturing like, Look, this is what we've done. This is what I did. Wait, Boom. one of them has look one at it. Has, one of them has a helmet on. The other doesn't. <laughs> is, why is he yeah, just wearing his helmet indoors like an I, ape shit? Okay, I feel like you're reading it. I feel like I know, but it's <laughs> the pro, the propagandists weren't expecting this kind of nitpicking. They weren't ex- it, it, filthy it, I, westerners. I had, whenever I looked at it, I didn't notice the thing that you did, which is that literally no country except the USSR exists in this, in this globe. <laughs> I mean, so, wait, so 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 it's so wait, 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 I, I have to the, the the woman with the helmet. It. Her hair looks awfully familiar because it looks very stiff. Is that is that the Mother Russia statue woman? That is okay. That's another thing I hadn't noticed, but yes, that that is exactly how the Mother Russia statue is depicted with like the hair Yo, flowing wait. backwards. Yeah, I knew it. Yeah, yeah, her hair is like flowing backwards and it and, and, and know, translated I know that's why they I know yeah, that's tra- why they did that because the the woman immediately behind her does not have that. There's wind just for her. Okay, and another thing, another thing, I, I can't put my finger on it because he may not be a significant figure, but that scientist's face looks somewhat familiar. I'm, I'm not sure. Maybe he kind of looks like. Uh, he definitely doesn't look like any of the the rocket scientists I know from the USSR, but he is el generico scientist again e- even even the cosmonaut doesn't really look like gagarin he's not even smiling but still like th- this was made like right after gagarin launches and and this one i'm i this is my favorite i'm gonna show it to you just because of how it it like with the first two p- pictures you can almost imagine the propagandist sitting there and thinking like why why are these pigs not eating this slop why do they not get it so I'm going to post this one, and I'm going to tell you what the caption reads. The caption reads, I am happy. This is my work joining the work of the Republic. I want you to describe what this is. There's a lot to unpack here. The smug welder staring at the ship that he tacked together going into orbit. It's, it, like, it's, it's a dude clearly working in a construction site watching a rocket lift off and just going like, I am happy. This is my work. This is the propagandist just like telling them. You feel you know, happy now. It, 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 it doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter if you're, you know, working a dead end job. You did space. Feel happy. <laughs> you have achieved a space. Yes. And yeah. And a bit of, a bit of a side <laughs> note there. The spoon fed of this is how you feel citizen. Bit, yes. bit, of a, bit of a side note for any, any viewers um, because the R7 rocket was still secret, they couldn't actually post any, like, accurate drawings of it. That looks surprisingly like a V2 in the background. Oh, yeah. Like, they, they went with the stereotypical Tintin rocket. The message of these posters was clear. Garen's flight was a success not just for the whole world, but also something that every Soviet citizen could take pride in. That every Soviet's contributions had together made this possible. 
This propaganda was also directed outwards. This was, after all, uh, the Gagarin that would travel the world. To the West, he was one more achievement that the Soviets had beaten them to, while in communist countries like China, he was used to bolster the Soviet Union's position as the preeminent communist power. This is around the time that you know other communist countries are starting to realize, like, hey, maybe we don't have to you know goose step behind Khrushchev. Um, Gagarin's personal role in the denomination of this cult was minimal. Who Gagarin was actually didn't really matter to the propagandists because he was meant to be a stand-in for all Soviets. He shook hands with world leaders and read the scripts the propagandists gave him. As it turns out, he was very good at giving speeches, something that got him noticed by a few Soviet politicians and allowed them to evolve his cult for their aims, which is how we transition to our next version of Gagarin. Gagarin. The Russian Patriot. This version of Gagarin was created when he was recruited by a man named Sergei Pavlov, the head of the Komsomol, to help prevent the moral degradation of Soviet youth. The, Kom- the Komsomol, or the All Union Leninist Young Communist League, was the youth wing of the Soviet Communist Party and the de facto Department of Youth for the Kremlin. From a 1962 Harvard report on the Komsomol, quote, Komsomol activities include, one, political instruction of Komsomol members, two, political instruction and leadership supplied by the Komsomols to the pioneers, to non-affiliate youth, and to other groups, three, military and paramilitary training and physical culture and sports, four, leadership and assistance in carrying out governmental and party programs, and five, social and cultural activities. It was basically like like state-sponsored Boy Scouts. And they got, you know, billions of rubles in funding for it. Oodles. Oh, yeah. Like, uh, there's, um, Com- Komsomol started off, um, mostly just as, like, a political, like, propagandizing tool, uh, for the Communist Party. But it later became, like, if you joined Komsomol, people learned, kids learned how to be pilots in Komsomol. Like, there were glider classes. Um, oh, shit. People like they they had they did you know shooting they did all kinds of stuff like if you joined Komsomol you could join different classes it depended on where you were but it it turned into a massive umbrella organization um, and on top of providing like ideological and military training for Soviet teens Komsomol was also a requirement for those who wanted to join the Communist Party the best of the Komsomol were picked for membership and there were barely any Soviet politicians who hadn't gone through Komsomol. In a very real way, Komsomol was responsible for molding new generations of Soviet leaders, which is why they approached Yuri Gagarin in 1962 for help. See, back then, Pavlov had a problem. With the Soviet Union becoming more open in the Khrushchev years, foreign ideas were getting in and influencing the Russian youth. You might notice I said Russian instead of Soviet, and that's because Sergei Pavlov (laughs) was a militant Russian nationalist and retooled Komsomol uh, in his tenure to focus purely on Russian traditions and culture at the expense of, like, any other nation in the USSR. In 1957, as part of the USSR thawing relations with the world, Moscow hosted the Sixth World Festival of Youth and Students. For many Soviet kids, this was their first real view of other cultures, and a lot of them liked what they saw. Uh, To Pavlov and the other leaders of Komsomol, this was a problem. Their remit was to raise the next generation of Russian leaders, and they viewed any outside influence like a poison, from Andrew Jenks. Komsomol leaders were in a panic as they searched for more proactive ways to counter the supposed infection of Western music and clothing, which, in their words, weakened the patriotic feelings of the Soviet people, loosened our morals, and spread the disease of skepticism and cynicism. Soyed our boys. So I, yes, <laughs> like okay, we'll, we'll get to this. Like, whenever the Gagarin stuff, like the actual Gagarin biography, comes around, we'll get more into this. But like Yuri Gagarin and all of this, it it if you understand it as basically being like incel stuff, it it reads so perfectly. Like he was Pavlov and Gagarin were so concerned about like the West feminizing <laughs> Russian men and like, putting <laughs> fluoride in the water, and they like they they host um, they host the uh, the I'm sixth so uh, World Festival of Youth and Students, and like basically all these kids from all around the world show up, and then Russian kids get to like meet them and go like, oh hey, this is what a Finnish kid is like, and like. 
Pavlov is sweating buckets. This is like watching these ideas get <laughs> spread around. <laughs> Those filthy ideas. He, yeah, they they t- like they take the ideas more seriously than like Russia did coronavirus. <laughs> oh Jesus Christ! <laughs> and <laughs> so, no, little Timmy, don't commit thought crime. <laughs> So, like they 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 see this disease spreading, and and to Pavlov, Gagarin was the perfect way to fight that disease. Soviet propaganda figures at the time were mostly old war heroes, uh, people Soviet youth couldn't really relate to. And just a quick aside here, um, at this time, there, that was actually like a big um, divide in Soviet culture was people who had been old enough to fight in the war and people who hadn't. Um, Huh. And there was often there was often this big kind of like it, it was like uh, the anti OK boomer kind of thing. It was like if if you were older and a kid was you know mouthing off to you, you basically just say like, "Yeah, what'd you do in the war? Oh, nothing. Yeah, shut up." Um, and since all of these like big figures, all of these Soviet heroes were war figures, Gagarin was the first one who actually like they could somewhat relate to all these all these Soviet kids. I mean, hello, kids. Yes, my my fellow children. Um, So, yeah, Gagarin was the first new hero that Soviet youth could look up to. Crucially, he also had a sense of humor and style. Like with a lot of the propaganda, Gagarin was not just some casual observer thrust into the spotlight. He was an eager adopter of Pavlov's ideas and jumped at the chance to be the new role model for Soviet kids. By all accounts, he really believed this stuff. Starting in 1962... Around the same time he became head of cosmonaut training, Yuri Gagarin started giving speeches at Komsomol rallies and writing opinion pieces for their newspaper, uh, Komsomolskaya Pravda. His enemies were the so-called Stiliagi, Soviet kids who had started copying Western cultural trends and clothing. They basically think of them as the hipsters of their time. The idea was to position Gagarin as the ideal model of a Russian man, someone of clear greatness, but also someone that any Russian could aspire to be. Komsomol had to walk a very thin line with this. Quoting from the Komsomol Bureau of Propaganda in Defense and Athletics. It is important to remind people that the cosmos is being explored, not by some supermen, but by simple folk who come from the people. So if they praise Gagarin too much, they risked making people think that his example was impossible to follow. In speeches and articles, Gagarin made clear his peasant upbringing. In a speech in Kaluga in 1964, he said, Yes, I love these small Russian towns. You know I'm from Kazatsk. It's also very pleasant, green, and very Russian. Very Russian. The, the <laughs> most Russian town there ever was. By the time of Gagarin's death in 1967, Komsomol had set up Gagarin clubs all around the Soviet Union where kids and teenagers could learn all the skills that made the great Yuri Gagarin the hero they all looked up to. The adoration for cosmonaut number one had long since taken on a culty sort of attitude, and this was only increased in his death, adopting new and freakish elements to match whatever the Kremlin and Soviet culture required him to be. The major theme was to teach Soviet citizens and children how to be like Gagarin, in the 1970s, amid a revival of Russian folk culture, school students started being instructed in Gagarin's childhood games. Gorelki. <laughs> a kind of hide-and-seek. Lapta. A traditional ball-and-stick game. And Volchok. <laughs> Pin the tail on the donkey. To encourage more students to pursue science and engineering, Komsomol opened Gagarin Institutes, specializing in aerospace and orbital mechanics. Even after his death, his mother maintained her popularity and took her cult on the road, teaching parents the proper ways to raise their children into the next generation of Gagarins. Gagarin, the sex symbol and celebrity. More than anything, Gagarin distinguished himself from earlier Soviet heroes as a sex symbol. He liked to be photographed working out, swimming, playing sports, or just shirtless. He also had a personal charisma that figures like Alexei Stakhanov, the legendary coal miner who mined 14 times his quota in one day, lacked. Uh, He had a sense of humor and always seemed to be smiling. All of this, the Soviet rumor mill jumped on. Stories emerged of Gagarin winding up in orgies during world tours, or that he spent more than a few nights with uh, Italian actress Gina Lollobrigida. Soviet women were also fascinated with Gagarin. Hair salons started offering a new hairstyle they called Love Me Gagarin, and every public press conference he held normally had people asking about his love life. Now, in the interest of being fair, 
Gagarin hated this denomination of his cult, and having to deal with his legions of horny fans, mostly because it created a lot of tension with his wife. <laughs> <laughs> You, as you can imagine, as you can imagine, uh, having having all those fans constantly asking, like she, she was not a fan. Um, so he he quickly started trying to push back against them, or at least make it clear to his fans that he was happily married. Uh, when a young woman asked him what kind of dress he liked to see women wear, he redirected, responding that his wife was beautiful in any dress, but yeah, I prefer without clothing. This, predictably, did not dissuade his fans. Uh, what also didn't help was that Gagarin's love life became an official concern of Komsomol. While you'd expect an organization charged with upholding morals for Soviet children to be a bit prudish, this was not the case. Uh, Gagarin being really good at sex played into an official narrative. Western women falling all over a rugged uh, Russian farm boy. How could they not? Their husbands were all, you know, fat cat capitalists who had never worked a day in their life. Uh, from Andrew Jenks, quote, at a Komsomol conference in 1962, one speaker remembered that he had accompanied Gagarin to an exhibit on France in Moscow. He spun a tale about Gagarin's ability to conquer even the most sophisticated French beauty. Among the French guides, said the speaker, there was a certain Veronica, who was a really nice looking girl. The audience laughed. The French guide asked, asked to be introduced to Gagarin. When the meeting was arranged and she saw him in person, she was dumbstruck by his handsomeness. You see what kind of boy are our Yura and German, said the, said the speaker, to boisterous applause and laughter. He apologized to Gagarin for being so crude. But that's the Komsomol way, he said. It's out of love for you, and how can you not love him? He hoped that Gagarin's wife would correctly understand this love. Uh, a comment that <laughs> evoked a stir from the audience. So while Gagarin was desperately trying to convince his wife that he was a loyal husband, an official organ of the Soviet state was having speeches about how good and how often he fucks. <laughs> and he, like, like with the fans, he hates this. He's desperately trying to get them to not talk about this. He's trying to not die in his sleep because his wife put a steak knife in his heart. It also has to be said, I I don't know how much of the stories are true. Um, like it was, all of this was heavily propagandized. Yuri Gagarin was not a faithful husband by any stretch of the imagination. Oh shit. Now, Yuri Gagarin was not just a sex symbol. In the years after his flight, he came to occupy a strange role as a decadent celebrity in a communist country. He was the first Soviet tourist, traveling the world and seeing the sights at a time when Soviet citizens could only hope to travel inside the country. He met politicians and royals, but also bumped elbows with actresses and supermodels at the best parties. Uh, he loved taking the Matra jet a sports car he'd been given in France on joyrides around Star City, while his official car, a solid blocky Volga, went largely unused. Most notably, and this is actually kind of a fun one, uh, Yuri Gagarin, the first man in space and hero of the Soviet Union, was the founder and first head of the Soviet Water Skiing Association. Immaculate. For, for all his fame, sometimes his antics got him into trouble. To protect himself... Gagarin had his sports car painted the more official black, just as he had suggested that water skiing was a perfectly proletarian sport, uh, the, the sport that you need a motorboat to do. Responding to criticism that water skiing was a frivolent and decadent Western fad, Gagarin said that on a trip to Cuba, he noticed that long-suffering Cuban citizens were fashioning water skis from wooden planks and connecting them to boats that could hardly be called yachts. So, like, he, he uses his fame... He starts exploiting all the perks of his fame. He starts, you know, hanging out with celebrities. He's traveling the world. He gets like an incredibly fast French sports car and he starts like a water skiing association. And whenever the old kind of like crusty communists in the government start criticizing him, he immediately goes on the defensive and like he paints his car black and he's like, no, 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 no. Water skiing is, is totally communist. It's the most communist thing you can do. Cuban Never peasant. explore more communist. C Cuban peasants do it. <laughs> Knowing what we know about the Soviet Union, you'd expect this side of Gagarin to be covered up. But this was the period of what's called communist utopianism. Uh, while there were definitely critics of Gagarin's excesses, the promise was that soon every Soviet citizen would have those luxuries. The cosmonauts weren't, you know, they weren't favorites or they and they weren't wealthy elites. 
they had just gotten there first. If everybody else waited, they would get there soon. So, so Gagarin came to fill a kind of like, he, he filled a strange role in Soviet society where he was a celebrity, but they also made sure to try and keep him at the level where, you know, anyone could reach that. They didn't want to make him into a superhero. Gagarin in post-Soviet and modern times. Even after Gagarin's death in 1968, the cult of Cosmonaut 1 never really went away. You can still find some of the more culty elements in the cities of, you know, Sar Saratov and Gagarin, where Yuri is viewed more of a, like a sainted figure than a, a national hero. But during the liberalizing of perestroika in the 80s, the cult was challenged for the first time. Crucially, it started to become okay to criticize official Soviet heroes. This was helped along by the so-called new media, the first independent newspapers and radio stations allowed in the Soviet Union. Now, rumors about Gagarin had existed for decades. It was well known that he had a drinking problem, that he was fond of pranks, and that he'd earned the prominent scar on his forehead diving out a second-story window after his wife found him with another woman. All of these were true, and very inconvenient for the Kremlin. A lot of the wilder elements of the Gagarin cult actually evolved as direct counters to the rumor mill. For example, the propagandists claimed that Gagarin really got his scar when he saved his daughter from a car crash. So when the new media came along, they already had a lot of material to work with. There were a lot of well-researched papers that sought to, you know, strip away the propaganda and figure out who the real Gagarin was, you know, like professional hard-hitting journalism stuff. And it all sold horribly. They weren't exciting enough to grab the attention of city dwellers, and rural Russians dismissed them as revisionist attempts to, you know, tear down their godly Soviet hero. But the new media wasn't just journalists going against the party line. The thing that really punched a hole in the myths around Gagarin were tabloids. From Andrew Jenks, quote, by the time the Soviet Union collapsed, the new tabloid press of the 1990s, centered in Moscow, had constructed a new Gagarin, cosmonaut number one as an alcoholic and dim-witted rube. He was Boris Yeltsin in a spacesuit, the first rogue in space, as one popular joke put it. The aim of these journalists was partly to tear down old icons, but mostly to titillate and sell newspapers. And there's, there's a point to be made here that throughout Soviet history, ever since Gagarin launched, there were efforts by the Kremlin to just make him look like whoever the current leader of Russia was. Like, right after he launched, uh, he was, you know, schmoozing with Khrushchev, and then Brezhnev took over, and there was a lot of, you know, coordination between the two of them. And now you see, right around the time that the Soviet Union collapses and Russia takes over, the view of Gagarin shifts to be like, oh, he's like Yeltsin. He's like this cool dude that we have running around um, being drunk. And it has to be said, the tabloids were kind of the 180 of the Soviet propaganda. So the, the old propaganda viewed Gagarin as, you know, completely sober, completely faithful, um, you know, very soft-spoken, very noble, all of that. And the tabloids make him into a, a drunken womanizer. And, and this wasn't necessarily untrue. It's just that the tabloids took what took what vices Gagarin did have, and they just turned it up to 11. Well, it's uh, sensationalist media. It sells yeah. well. Like it, mm -hmm. but, but even then, like, it's still, it's still got that little core of truth in it. Like, it reminds me of, like, when you go to the grocery store and you go to the checkout aisle and they have, like, the shitty magazines there. Oh, the batshit tabloids? Yeah, it was, like, batshit tabloids, yeah. Like, uh, the Soviet tabloids, they start doing this about Gagarin. They start taking all of his all of his weird stories, all of the, you know, the stories that did exist. They created their own Gagarin, the same way of the sex symbol and the nationalist hero. They just turn him into um, this uh, sex-crazed drunken maniac. That's not going to go well for them not in the long term. <laughs> <laughs> but even this doesn't kill the Gagarin cult. While the tabloids wrote their stories about a drunken womanizer for the citizens of Moscow, like we said, provincial Russians continued to worship the man. And that's where it would stay. Two different versions of Gagarin existing in different parts of Russia, were it not for a dictator you might have heard of called Vladimir Putin. We made it. Yeah, we, find, we, we got there. It's, we've come full circle. We, it's we, finally we, here. 
we, we, are, so, we are back. <laughs> we have circled back around to the main crux of this podcast uh, an hour or so later. Since taking power in the late 90s, Putin's government has massively ramped up propaganda in an effort to create both a heavy nostalgia for the time when Russia was a superpower and to make a perception that the evil West is out to tear down good Russian heroes. Under Putin, the Gagarin cult has gone from a rural tradition in, you know, Saratov in the city of Gagarin to the official position of Russian state propaganda. True stories that were published, I have to stress this, these stories were published by Russian newspapers have officially been deemed Western attempts to smear the legacy of a great Russian hero. Gagarin clubs are making a big comeback with children and teenagers learning all about space exploration, aerospace engineering, but also just learning things about being, you know, a good Russian. And Gagarin's family, especially his daughter Elena, are getting increasingly litigious with anyone who dares publish the truth, suing them or even getting them blacklisted. It was only in 2013 that the first movie about Gagarin's flight was made, and that's only because it followed the government's story to a T. It kind of, kind of um, quick note on his family. Elena, his daughter, is actually the head of the Gagarin Museum in Moscow, or at least um, I don't know if she's officially the head, but she handles all the tours, and she also handles the, uh, the family's tradition of suing anyone who publishes anything in Russia that claims uh, that her father drank alcohol occasionally or wasn't the perfect faithful uh, husband. Sorry, honey. Your dad was railing them. It's, uh, like, and she knows. She's his daughter. She has to know. The, fa- the fact that she... I would have the brand. Okay, yeah. I, 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 what if I, she's I, just been? What if she's like? There's, there's the, there's the word for that. I'm trying to remember what it is. Or it's like you've been denial. High on, no, no, no. You've just like been high on your own shit for so long, and it's now like you're undoing. You fooled you've yourself. Like deluded yourself into thinking that your bullshit is just the real thing. So maybe, maybe the Gagarin family has just maintained this lie for so long that they've gone full circle, and now, now Elena Gagarina is a full-on believer that her father was a perfect soviet superhero your dad wasn't selling rail absolutely not and that he wasn't just you know a guy you know like such a better story he's just a regular dude he would be so much more relatable if he was just a regular dude and they recognized that he had flaws at the same time though we're going to eventually get into this with the uh the gagarin biography stuff he was not just a regular dude and the flaws he had it's you know obviously up to the up to the observer i think he was a very bad person and this was this was a shock to me i have a signed picture of gagarin on my desk right in front of me right now and i learned that he was a pretty pretty horrible man anyway um as with every other generation gagarin's story has had to change to fit the needs of russian culture he remains a sober and noble hero, but they've actually had to recast him from an atheist to a devout Orthodox Christian. Uh, that famous Soviet quote that gets applied to him that he, you know, I see no God from space, gone. Russian kids don't learn about that anymore. It's an evil Western plot to make you think that uh, Gagarin was atheist. Cosmonautics Day, the yearly celebration of Gagarin's flight, has slowly morphed from a festival on space achievements into a nationalistic parade for the new Russia. Perfect. Yuri Gagarin in 2022. All of that brings us to today. Yuri Gagarin's legacy remains a powerful tool for the Russian government, and we recently got to see a great example of its use. On April 12th, 2022, the 61st anniversary of Gagarin's flight, Vladimir Putin visited Vostoshny Cosmodrome, I guarantee you I said that wrong, uh, Russia's new spaceport in the Far East. It was his first public appearance since the Russian army's disastrous withdrawal from Kiev. His speech was a weird mix of current events and celebration of the first manned spaceflight. In the same breath that he talked about Russia's plans to launch a lunar probe before the end of the year, he declared the massacre of civilians in Bucha to be fake news. He said that Western sanctions had failed to hurt the Russian economy and that Roscosmos didn't need to cooperate with NASA or China's CNSA because they had found a new partner to explore space with, Belarus. He even dragged Belarus's president, Alexander Lukashenko, along to the Cosmodrome. And there's, you can find great pictures of this. Lukashenko gave a little speech. 
He's he's just this weird fat dude in like a really overdone military uniform <laughs> standing next to this rocket. This rules. Just the fact that you can stand up there and say like China, America, don't I don't need, need the two I don't we don't we don't need the two <laughs> most affluent and powerful countries on earth. We have our lackey, Belarus. I've got my I've got a new friend. Not just that. You he's know, gonna go to space with me. Putin did also offer to launch uh, Alexander Lukashenko into space, and I I don't know the full context. <laughs> was I that choose, a threat? I choose to imagine there was a bit of a threat because as much as Belarus is Russia's lackey, a lot of the time there have been times when uh, their relationship has been a little rocky. Oh, that has never happened in the history. Yeah. So the crux of the speech and where I'm going to cap off this episode – was a section where Putin directly compared the Soviet decision to launch a man into space to his decision to invade Ukraine. Quote from the man himself. In 1961, the Soviet Union was in complete technological isolation, and the sanctions against it were overwhelming. Nevertheless, the Soviet Union became the first country to orbit an artificial Earth satellite, the first man in space was a Soviet citizen, and the first space station was ours, and the first mission to the moon was ours as well, if memory serves. The first spacewalk was by our man, and the first woman in space was our Valentina Tereshkova, God bless her. That's all one run-on sentence. We did all that in conditions of complete technical isolation, and yet we made these incredible achievements. So... That's where that's where we're going to end things today. The Gagarin cult remains in full swing, and his legacy is still used for state propaganda. History repeats itself, and no one has learned anything. It has repeated itself. It will continue to repeat itself. God yes. bless. It, history repeats itself, and no one ever learned anything, except for the listeners today. Oh, cool. They're the real winners. Our, our, true winners. Our, our, wonderful, our wonderful, beautiful listeners. And on that note, Thank you all for listening or watching if you're on YouTube. Uh, like we said before, we're going to be keeping to a once every two weeks schedule. And with the next episode, we're going to be getting back into the story of Sputnik 1. Oh, God, I can't wait. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be great. I love my shiny ball. Thank you for listening to Failure to Launch. If you enjoyed the show, please leave us a review or tell a friend. Everything helps. If you want to follow us, contact us, or suggest a topic, you can email us at launchfailurepodcast at gmail.com. We're also on Twitter at launch underscore failure. Failure to Launch is hosted on Anchor, and we post on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. We also post our episodes with visual aids on YouTube at Failure to Launch. All music was provided by DJ Danarchy.